And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a newcomer to the temple, coming to us straight from Bonfire Productions, the executive producer therein, and creators of the upcoming... 5e campaign setting, The Alhami Sky. The one and only, the man of a thousand, not a thousand, a million Cheerios boxes, <laughs> Jacob Marshall. How are you doing today, man? I am doing good, Mildred. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, I, um, I, w I would use the whole... Okay, let me get this out of, the, out of the way. Why the hell are you nicknamed Jake the Snake? Because as a wrestling <laughs> fan, that puts in a whole other set of connotations in my head. <laughs> Well, uh, my nickname actually, it's funny. So I, my full name is Jacob. Mm -hmm. My full name is Jacob Marshall. And uh, I, I used to correct people whenever they would say like, hey, Jake. Um, they'd say like, hey, Jake, whatever. I'd say, oh, just, just call me Jacob because I preferred it. I had this uh, weird thing about like shortening names and uh, it kind of irks me a little bit. But then uh, I met my, uh, my girlfriend uh, my beautiful girlfriend, uh, who, when I first met her, she called me Jake, and I did not correct her, and uh, my name just sort of became that, and uh, uh, someone at, at some point had said to me, like, oh, hey, Jake the Snake, um, just to, like, try and be funny, and then I said, okay, that's, I'm just going to use that from now on. It's, uh, it, it, it takes the, a little bit of the uh, irk out of it for me, I suppose. For using the name Jake, mm. but uh, yeah, that's kind of the history. Yeah. Now, when it com when it comes to although now for first off, I like to open with the humble beginnings, as it were. Um. So with that in mind, walk me through your first introduction to role playing games, and what was it that made it stick for you? Um, oh, my first introduction to role playing games. I I'm um I'm a fairly young guy. Um I'm still in university. Um and my project is being done <clears throat> done through my university. Mm -hmm. Um and so I was only introduced to role playing games about three three and a half years ago. Um when I had a friend who called me over and I wasn't really doing anything that day and they said hey let's uh let's do something crazy that we never you know we probably never would have thought of doing let's go play D dungeons and dragons and i said i have no idea how to play dungeons and dragons that you know i'm i'm a pretty nerdy guy as it is do i really want to stick this uh in my repertoire of 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 what you know who i am uh you know dungeons and dragons so i want to be labeled the dungeons and dragons guy but i said okay let's sure let's go mm -hmm. so i went over to my friend's house and she had played a couple times um and she decided hey uh, i'll be the dm uh, there was like three of us at the table uh here's this really sort of generic story about you're sitting in a tavern and you have a quest to retrieve it was like uh, an amulet here's your quest go ahead and do it and i i just went crazy i went with my character, I decided I'm going to make the wackiest, goofiest. If I'm going to play this nerdy ass game, then I am going to make the wackiest, silliest character I can. And I made uh, an orc barbarian named Gro Yeet, who was just supposed to be the embodiment of gruff, of 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 roughing it and toughing it. And I had an absolute blast. Um, and I, I I saw this is not just you know this is not just some nerdy game about numbers and, and making up stories. It's it's actual like mechanical and uh, you know freeing kind of game. It was so uh, the big moment for me was um, I think I uh, we, we had to like get into the, some city and uh, I said to my, my DM I wanted to like dig a hole underneath the walls of the city to, to get in there and when she said yes and like yes you can do that and it's no problem I was like this is so much different than a video game like I can do anything I want. So that's kind of what sparked my interest in it initially, mm -hmm. and how I, I entered the tabletop scene. And then when I when I moved on to university, uh, or maybe I was already in my first year, I don't remember. But, but when I was went back to school, I immediately like sort of sought out the uh, D and D club, or it was the tabletop role playing club at, at my university, 
I joined a group. I met some really amazing people, and uh, they kind of led me through led me through my first real campaign. Um, and it, right after that was finished, I I wrote my own and decided to to DM for them. And I did that for about a year, and uh, and now we're we're all still together, and we have a really good time with it. That's kind of my introduction to tabletops. Mm-hmm. Um, with with that kind of thing in with that kind of thing in mind. Now, when it came to the idea of the Alhami Sky, how did how did that come? How did that kind of thing come about? Um, is, so, oh yeah, sorry. Go ahead. Um, well, part part of the re- part of the reason I ask in in that regard is is um. It's def it's definitely it's definitely not going it's definitely going to be a kind of setting that, at least from at least from my estimation, that a lot that a lot of people, that will be that will be definitely a um bit of bit of a reach for for those who are, more more accustomed to the traditional type of five E campaign. Yeah, yeah. Um, I totally hear you. So my the Alhami Sky, you know, it takes it's this world of floating islands in the sky. These islands have been lifted up because the world below them has kind of been covered in this horrible red mist that that makes people go mad and turn into monsters and all this sort of crazy stuff. Um, this idea was sparked from actually one single encounter I ran with my my players with that university group I was telling you about. Um, we had they they had gone to another plane of existence, um, and in this plane of existence there was no there was no floor. It was just um, all these little floating islands, and uh, it, it was just supposed to be a fun little thing. I thought, okay, yeah, there'll be like a fun little like one session gimmick to have floating islands, and the players will need to be careful, and uh, you know they, they can't like fall off. They have like a little airship they're using to fly around. Maybe they'll have a good time with it. Um, and my players. They, they did such a good job of entering this world and utilizing it in such a unique way. Um, they, they really took the, that freedom element I was talking about with, with tabletop role-playing games, mm-hmm. and they pushed it to the absolute limit. They, they were flying around the islands. They were, they were drilling, like kind of coming up from underneath the islands. They were doing these like sort of SWAT team drop-downs onto them. Um, they were ramming their ships to move the islands by crashing them into these uh, the, the floating islands. I was like, wow! Like they're they're taking this to a whole new level with their their creativity. Um, at one point, I had one of my players uh, fall off of his airship, and we had a whole like, the group of them were on an airship, and one of them jumped off or or fell off, I think. Um, and one of the other players, I think they jumped into the ballista. They they had a little ballista on their ship. He he loaded himself into the ballista and fired it at. Uh, his companion who had fallen off the ship and once they had collided he casted a spell uh, I can't remember if it was Misty Step or something along those lines mm-hmm. um, to teleport the, the two of them back onto the ship and I was like wow right there that, that's a that's a big moment right there so I, I kind of had a flash of inspiration that night and I, I think I wrote like over the course of two or three days I wrote like 30 pages um, of content for, for a world that could kind of like take place in the sky and I was like wow this is this is so new and so different. It's so, uh, like I keep saying, freeing. Um, and that I think because that's what I love about the game, that's kind of why I've chosen this setting and and why I'm I'm trying to be a little bit different in that way. Um, I shouldn't I should note that as, as soon as I saw that you're that you had airships in this, I had, I had immediately sent the uh, I had immediately sent the Kickstarter info to. Um, a friend of the show, James Streisand, aka Ash of Creativity, since airships is one of the things that he d- that he does um, almost obsessively. The well that well that and insisting that no, insisting of no A's, which he had to get he had to get on me about. Um. But what? But when it came, but for you. With a setting like this, there's obviously going to be a fair emphasis on airships. What what about air, what about airships is appealing to you? I think what appeals to me about airships is um, the fact that you can you kind of make it like your home. You know, it can kind of be like your 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 little base. It can be your little base of operations. I think I uh, at one point in my first campaign, 
me and my players had bought like a cart. We bought like a little, like like a small horse-drawn wagon. Uh, it was like a covered wagon. And we loved this cart to death. We pimped it out. We upgraded it in a couple of the towns we went to. We, we bought like shelves to put inside it. We were like, oh, what kind of wood are we going to use? Blah, blah, blah. We were getting really into it. And uh, I think airships are, because of the nature of, of the campaign, um, they're going to be another really good opportunity to sort of make it your own and like really like feel a connection to something in the world. Uh, I think that, that that's one big part of it for me. Uh, in our campaign, there's a few different ways that airships work. We've got um, we've got you know balloons like standard balloons. Airships are lifted by those. Um, we've got these magic crystals that that can be placed within an airship to give it uh, lift properties. Uh, and we even got like very uh, experimental kind of combustion engines uh, that can propel airship. <clears throat> excuse me, airships. Um, so I think customization and, and the uniqueness and uh, really feeling like you can make something your own in this world um, is what really gets me about about airships. All right, I get, I can, I got you on that. Um, now, Winnick, now. Within within that, you've the other thing that, that you you've kind of set up is this idea of the um the sky the skyborne archipelago oh, and um a almost hellscape like area under under the uh, clouds, um was was that just a means of show, of showing the of showing the contrast between the two major regions? Yeah, uh, we we had to write a, like a production document for um, for the project to put it through my school, and co the word contrast must have been put into that document like like a hundred times. Maybe that's an exaggeration, but it felt like I was writing that like mm -hmm. every couple of sentences. Because yes, you're right. the The contrast between the the sky above, the the free, the open, the blue, um, light hearted kind of atmosphere you have up there. And the hellish, eldritch horror, oh my gosh, kill me now kind of uh, atmosphere you have down on the, on the world below that has been absolutely ruined and desecrated. Um, contrast is such an important element of that. And, uh, you know, the idea really is uh, if you somehow manage to survive the fall, um, if you, let's say you're flying around and you fall off your airship, if you somehow manage to survive this, this, 10,000 foot fall, let's say you have a spell for it or something, surviving the world below is going to be a whole other endeavor. Um, and you're going to be in a whole new world. It's going to be absolutely different from where you were just a few moments ago. Mm -hmm. um, when, now, when it comes, now, um, when it comes to the, when it comes to the book, it's the book itself. Um, now you now um, if I'm not mistaken, you guys are aiming for a um for having this be equal parts a campaign setting, as well as a campaign well itself. Um, with that with that kind of th is, do you have do, do you have it planned that it's that all that's going to be in one book? Or are you planning on um splitting it? We do plan on all of it being in one book. It's yeah. a little ambitious. Um, but we feel that we can actively um, provide a narrative to to players that want to use this 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 campaign module um, while also guiding them through through a world. We think that um, you know you can take uh, you can send your players into a tavern and there's an NPC that you plan for them to talk to and they'll talk to every single NPC in the tavern except for that one if they feel like it. Um, we know that might happen. So providing this world as a sort of background, um, I think will give DMs a really good tool. And then this narrative, which is sort of woven into it and, and players will hopefully kind of accept and uh, interact with, it, it, it's also sort of a, um, they're both side by side and they're there if you want, want to use it. If you want to follow this main narrative, you can. If you just want to explore the, the world, you can. But we've also written in consequences for uh, what happens if if you ignore a certain part of the book? Not to say that it, you know you shouldn't ignore uh, or you should ignore or you shouldn't ignore a certain part of the book. You know it, it's totally up to the player. 
Um, but it's it's how does how do you interact with this world, and how is this world going to interact back with you? And the narrative is an important part of how it interacts back with the player. I think. Mm -hmm. Now, with, now um, when it comes when it comes to when it comes to those adventures, um, are they are they written out as a full as a full long form campaign going from levels one to ten, or are they a series of standalone adventures? It's a series of standalone adventures. There's um, there's elements that weave them together. There's hooks at the end of one that could very easily lead into the next. Mm -hmm. But uh, at the end of the day, they could all be taken, um, you know, in different orders or, or wherever you want to go with it. You can skip some. There's some that you um, you might really want to do. There's some that you might find keep popping up in your face because of the kind of uh, the, the nature of, of the whole region of, of the Alhami sky, that is to say, um, you have this antagonist who we've shown off on our Kickstarter page, Cobal, who's kind of risen up from the, the world below this flying monstrous airship, like half Eldridge, half airship. Mm -hmm. um, and he's going to be, he's going to be on your ass for this campaign. He's going to be hunting you down. So um, you might find that certain uh, quests pop up more than others, but at the end of the day, Yes, they are standalone. Is is it a case where each of them has a recommended level, or did you des design them to be in that level one to ten range, but could be done in any order? They do have a recommended level. They are set at a, a, a one particular level, and that's not to say a DM can't go ahead and try and um, uh, reconfigure it for for players at a higher or lower level. That you know, it's, of course, is up to them if they want to try and substitute um, some HP or some monsters, perhaps, but. Uh, there will be a certain level set um, in certain areas, and that you know that p plays a, a particular role with the world below because the world below is a, is a pretty high level area. I think right now we've got it set at at seventh level um, is when players will be able to sort of easily engage with the world below. But that has consequences in that if a player were to try and enter the world below, or if they were to fall off their airship, or fall off an island, or jump off willingly they're going to have a really tough time at those earlier levels. And that is done on purpose. You know, we're, we're trying to emphasize the, the difficulty and the, the treacherousness of that world below. Um, you know, I want to say this is going to be a hard campaign. It's going to be a somewhat difficult campaign at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. um, it's going to be like, uh, what's that one, that really iconic one, Tomb of Annihilation, is that it? Um, uh, Tomb of Horrors. If if, if you're talking about if you're talking about a hard if you're talking about a hard campaign that's been infamous for years, Tomb of Horrors is that is that one. Thank you. My mistake. Yes, that's what I was trying to say. Um, it's not. I don't know if it's going to be at that level, but we're trying to make it with a with a tad of difficulty here. Death uh, is uh, death is a very big probability. Um, it's and it's in, it's in, since you mentioned Tomb of Horrors, um. That that particular one, the inf a, a big um, a big amount of um, infamy that com that comes around is is um, the fact that it ends up being a meat grinder full of traps everywhere. Um, is that the level of difficulty that you that you want to go with, or do you want to make it that it's going it's going to kick your ass if you don't know what you're doing, but if you if you've got a if you've got a clue. Then you'll um, be relatively fine. Uh, I want to say it's going to be. If you think about the 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 nature of the of the world, it's going to be hard for us to fit traps in the open sky. Um, if players are flying from point A to point B, they're not going to. I don't think the traps are going to be their biggest concern. It's going to be monsters. It's going to be enemies. It's going to be encounters. It might be. Um, storms, it might be things like the natural environment might be able to get them, might be running out of food, or well, if a DM, I suppose, wants to use some sort of uh, rules on food and survival. But um, but no, I don't want to say traps and, and like a meat grinder, like you jump in and into this, this temple or something and becomes like a, a hellish meat grinder. I just want to say it might be more about us communicating hints to the player about enemy weaknesses or or enemy types, or um, certain items they want might want to collect, and whether or not they decide to go and get those and use those, or whether or not they feel they're confident enough to proceed to the next area or fight that next enemy without them. Um, so I think that's that's a bit more of the style we're going for. Yeah. 
now when it now when it comes to when it come when it come, when it comes to the tone of fantasy because um an issue an issue that is that has been around with D&D for years is not is not knowing when to shit or get off the pot when it comes to what sort of fantasy it is but obviously that's not a problem that you guys are going to have because you're creating a given setting um do you con- do you consider what sort of fantasy do you consider the Alhami Sky to be? Do you consider it to be high fantasy? Do you consider it to be, um, well, it's, pro- it's probably not low fantasy, given the fact that we've got friggin' airships and floating islands. <laughs> but do you con- do you consider it to be um, dark fantasy? Do you consider it to be more like more like sor- more like an airship version of swords and sorcery? Where does Alhami fit in the equation? See, I want to say I'm I'm very biased because. Uh, for for this sort of thing, I personally do not adore high fantasy, like super high fantasy. Um, I, I I very much so like sword and sorcery. Mm-hmm. But for this campaign, I want to say we're probably somewhere in in between high fantasy and, and and sword and sorcery. Maybe maybe inching a little bit more towards sword and sword and sorcery because of uh, the technological kind of advancements that we've written into the world. We've we've decided to Take a few instances of, let's say, airship propulsion mm-hmm. uh, mechanisms, and instead of using magical means to power them, we've introduced technological ways to do so. So, I guess if you were to look at it that way, yes, we are more on the side of sword and sorcery. Um, it, if you go into the world below, though, you're very quickly going to find that, uh, you know, in, in this ruined world, mm-hmm. uh, dark fantasy and dark horror it becomes very prevalent um so that's i think that's what i would say about that yeah um when it comes now when it comes to one something that something that i'm cu- i'm curious about and i can i'd kind of touched on this earlier but with with stuff with stuff like the with stuff like the red mist and the and the underground of it what what's what sort of what sort of can you can you cite any sort of media's whether whether it be ga- whether it be games vi- video shows or or whatever that you would definitely um, pin down as influences when it came to the identity of Alhami as a setting. Uh, I want to say Darkest Dungeon. <laughs> if you played that game, oh yeah, I'm um, looking forward uh, to the board game too. Yeah, I think they recently the the trailer for their Kickstarter released very very recently, if not today, um, for for their board game. I I love Darkest Dungeon, and I love the the whole atmosphere, the mysterious atmosphere around it, which eventually kind of devolves into this this horrifying uh, eldritch like you know disaster that occurs in, in the narrative. It, it's so good. And I think that's that's one of my biggest influences for the world below is yeah. uh is what they did with, with, with what Red Hook Studios did with with that kind of mm-hmm. narrative. Um I love the imagery. I love the aesthetic. Um I love all of it. So I, I wanna say that's probably my biggest influence. It's it's very it's very much a dark I like to describe Darkest Dungeon as what did ha- what would happen if a- what would happen if Alan Moore wrote wrote a wrote a fantasy story and wasn't an asshole? <laughs> yeah. Look, he's look he's put out he's put out some great comics over the years, but um, the guy's a dick. Mm. <laughs> um. Some some of it some of it is is warranted because he um he's been nursing a grudge for it against DC since since uh, the days of Watchmen, um, mm-hmm. but. He, uh, but he can he can be he can be a bit of he can be a bit um cantankerous. Um, now when it now when it comes to when it comes to the um, when it comes to the races that you had um that you had on the on the on Alham the king, the kingdom up in the skies, um, did you end did you end up using um. Humans, elves, and, and dwarves to ca- to kind of um, keep things focused, instead of using instead of doing a oh you can just use en- you can just use any race approach. Uh, 
Yeah, I want to say we we did a focus on human elves and dwarves to to keep that kind of focused approach and also to keep things closer to the sword and sorcery side. I mean, when you get into high fantasy, suddenly you get into every single race to ever be conceived. You know, every single animal now suddenly has an anthropomorphic race associated with it. Mm -hmm. Um, But we've we've written it into our Kickstarter page and we've written it into the book itself that other races are allowed. You know, of course, other races can appear um, from far off lands. They just might get certain looks. They might get certain attitudes from NPCs. Um, it is, it is in terms of the world we've written and the history we've written, you know, oh, hey, what were the countries like before Alham rose up into the sky? Like, what were its neighbors like? What was the deal? We've taken a focus to humans, dwarves, and elves and their locations and their origins within this world uh, as opposed to, yes, uh, we're going to write about, you know, young T or... Uh, uh, you know, every single race in the in the five E, you know, compendium. So yeah, definitely a focused approach. You got us there. Um, which I'm perfectly fine with, especially since the, some of the, I'd say I'd say there's a few races in the in the handbook that um that would be arguably be a little maybe it's just me, but it would be a little bit trickier to implement. Um, one of the big ones being um tieflings. Um, like it's, I'd I get the feeling that it's a little, it would be a little bit trickier to implement them when demons and extra planers aren't as much of a thing in this kind of setting. Yeah, you know, I I want to give our players as much freedom as they can. If they want to play a tiefling, I don't, we're not going to write in the book, hey, you can't be a tiefling in this campaign. Yeah. Um, but we're also going to write, hey, if you play a tiefling in this campaign. You know, you've got these horns, you've got this tail. People in the world above are going to see you and freak out a little bit, thinking that you know the world below is invading or something like that. Yeah. Um, and not to say that's a bad thing. You know, that that makes for interesting narrative. That makes for a story. That makes for um, a new layer of RP in the campaign. Um, uh, but, but yeah, you're you're right. There, there's there's consequences to it, and also um, it's sometimes a little bit difficult to. Uh, address uh, when there's there's inconsistencies in lore or like origin stories for different races. Yeah. Um. And now, obviously, you are introducing two two new races in the um harpies and the half eldritch. Um. Now, when it comes when it comes to when it comes to the um har- when it comes to the harpies, one of the things of with um. Given given what they are, would it be would it be a case where they do have a na- a natural fly speed, starting out? Uh yes, they should. They will have like a natural fly speed. There's mm-hmm. it's going to be, see, the the three dimensional rules. This, this is one of our biggest challenges as as writers for this campaign. Is how do we take this two dimensional, typically two dimensional board game? Maybe you need to worry about like a couple levels of a dungeon or or 50 feet above you, or 50 feet below you, or something like that. How do we take these this two-dimensional board game and make it three-dimensional and make it fun, three-dimensional? Um, so yes, harpies will have a fly speed. So <laughs> more simple answer to your question is yes, they will have a fly speed. Um, but we're looking at implementing certain mechanics to try and, or optional mechanics, I should say, to try and ease uh, three-dimensional combat a little bit and, and how fly speed might work. Mm-hmm. Might work. And when it... And as far as the half eldritch, um, when it comes to when it comes to their racial entry, do you plan on putting like some sort of muta- some sort of randomized mutation table? Because um, I get the I get the feeling that there's not a standardization when it comes to what mutations somebody might end up getting. You got it. You're right on the nose with that. It's. It's control is uh, not a thing when it comes to the world below. It is all about chaos. It is all about randomness. Um, there will be a, a sort of list of, of mutations, as you say, that a player might experience if they choose, um, or if they become, you know, uh, part of this half elder trace. Um, I, I took one big piece of inspiration for me for the half elder trace was um, if you've ever played Dark Souls 1. Uh, yep. Uh, okay, so the DLC boss, one of the DLC bosses, Manus of the Abyss, 
Um, he's got this uh, arm, this monkey arm, which can extend and is all violent and it's moving in every direction uh, around him. It, it looks like it's almost not even in his control. Um, that kind of sparked this idea of, oh, man, it would be really cool to have uh, a race that has these sort of you know, parts of them. You know, parts of them are mutated mm -hmm. in a certain way and they, they can be oriented or used um, differently compared to other races. So that's kind of how that works and where it came from. Yeah. And taking that into account, is it is it a case where you where um when make when when make if someone was to make a a half eldritch character, would would they have to roll in a universal mutation table or would the um mutations be specialized to given limbs? Um well, it's not like, yes, it will be like to certain parts of their body. We don't want to give players every single mutation because these mutations will, they'll come with like consequences, but they'll also come with like pretty big buffs. Like being able to extend one of your limbs, um, you know, can be a really, really big boon in, in some situations. So we want to kind of give DMs a little bit of discretion because there's going to be certain instances or, or certain elements of a player's backstory that might dictate how they got their mutation. So we want to give DMs a little bit of discretion for how they apply mutations or how they give players mutations or whether they let players choose their own mutations, perhaps even in very specific scenarios. So I think it's very, uh, uh, it's on a very, very case by case basis for which mutations are chosen and how. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. And when it comes, when it, um, now when it, now, obviously there's the, the other thing I wanted to ask is on the, is on the, um, Hemorrhack, uh, subclass that you're at, that you're adding, which is get which is going to be a subclass for Rangers. Um, what per, what particular th what particular things is that particular class going to add to the Rangers um, su um, sandbox? So the Hemorrhack uh, really focuses on so it's this the, the Hemorrhack studies the old world. The Hemorrhack uh, views the old world, the world below, and and understands the techniques and the embodies the kind of. Uh, uh, I want to say attitudes <laughs> that that are held, held down there are the sort of they, they are the embodiment of of those sort of techniques that that come from below. And that is to say that um, you know violence, you know, intense violence, anger, uh, and and bleeds are, are the kit of the hemorrhag. So the hemorrhag focuses not on doing um, significant damage in one round, but focuses on doing a much more damage than their companions except over a long period of time so bleeds are the name of the game in terms of of what the hemorrhack gives um of the ranger and you know how those bleeds affect the battlefield and how those bleeds can affect the game um is pretty interesting i think how we've written it. so there's i'll give you a little sneak peek into some of the uh, abilities of the hemorrhack for instance we have this um so basically the whole class revolves around one single mechanic, and that mechanic is inflicting bleeds. When you hit an enemy, you can inflict bleeding damage. Um, and I won't get into all the the numbers for, you know, what happens like when you hit an enemy and and how much bleed and blah blah blah. But basically, you, you hit an enemy and you're going to apply bleed, and this can lead to a couple of different scenarios. There's one ability that Hemorak has where um, her move speed is increased for each enemy that is bleeding on the field. So suddenly, let's say you you know you put out three attacks um, and you land all three of them. Suddenly, you have thirty more move speed that round if you landed on three different enemies. Um, you know, another ability is the hemorrhag can actually, if there's a bleeding enemy, um, she can leap onto the enemy and take a bite out of them um, and heal a little bit from that attack. Uh, as long as as the enemy is bleeding, then she'll heal for a certain percentage, or like maybe I think it's half. Of the amount of bleed stacks that enemy has on them, so it's uh, we, we've designed it around um, 
hey, can I get this affliction on these enemies, and then what can I do from there? Um, yeah. And then in terms of RP, this character goes hand in hand with our, our narrative and our campaign setting because it, you know she's based on the study of the old world, the world below, as, as we call it. Mm -hmm. um, and and then we thought that ranger was the most appropriate class for that because they are on the you know they're on the wild frontiers they are in the the wild studying different elements of protecting nature sometimes or the like so yeah i think that's that, does that answer your question <laughs> yeah and when it when it comes to when it, now i i know that there's that there's that there's going to be that but when but um <laughs> um one of the things i noticed in the bullet points for the book for the book features is writing the optional introductory adventures and that and give me my subclass now um yeah. who's that was that somebody's edit <laughs> that, that was me i put that in. uh when i uh when i was playing um curse of strahd mm -hmm. i was playing curse of strahd and uh my dm was like oh there's an optional first adventure do you guys want to do it and I'm like, no, give me my subclass now. But uh, we did end up doing the first adventure, and I had a good time. But uh, yeah, <laughs> which, and admittedly, that admittedly that is a, a bit of an issue where it seems like your class doesn't really get interesting until your third level. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think I was a fighter. I'm a fighter for that campaign, so I uh, mm -hmm. had to wait till till third level to start doing all that stuff. Oh yeah! Oh yeah! The, oh yes, the fighter, the the um, the cl the Rodney Dangerfield of D and D classes. Oh boy, I'm not sure I get that reference <laughs> because <laughs> might, because they get be no respect. Younger. Because they uh, get no respect. I, I wear I wear my basicness as a badge of honor. I I am a very basic guy sometimes when it comes to my personal character creation. Um, you know, will, Cheerios is my favorite cereal, so take what you will from that. Um, look, I've de I've de I've de I've, de I've dealt with I've dealt with worse. Um, I can't really I can't really talk I can't really talk much on that because I because I'm a um I'm an oatmeal guy, not a not a not as much of a cereal guy. Respectable. Um, although I really hope you don't have you don't have one million boxes of of um of Cheerios in your. <laughs> In your bag of holding. <laughs> no, uh, no. Funny story, actually. For I think I was like for my fourteenth birthday, my parents got me six boxes of Plains Cheerios for my birthday, and I was I was so ecstatic. <laughs> I was so happy about that. <laughs> um, but when when it comes to when it comes to some of the other things that's get that's getting added to to the um, sand to the um, player end of the sandbox. Um, now. Backgrounds is kind of, is kind of self-explanatory, but I want to focus on um, skills and feats. So, given given the nature of air, of airships and the, and thus new forms of technology along with it, would it be fair would it be fair of me to say that some of the new um, skills are going to be reflective of the inclusion of that technology? You are right uh, once again <laughs> right on the nose. You can read my mind. So in terms of skills, we, we are focusing on a kind of mechanical um, and, and like piloting and uh, mm -hmm. flight kind of aspects of, of the book. As a lot of these skills is how do, we, how do you interact with this new technology and how do you interact with this new world? Because you're up here in the sky, there's consequences for that. Yeah. Um, so the skills do revolve around that. <clears throat> um, and they might, mm -hmm. they might not be the most... Uh, you know, their skills, they're not the most, oh, I would never think that's a skill. Like, I'll, I'll say it right now, one of our skills is, like, mechanics, um, you know, mechanical kind of base skill. So, um, but that has a bit, having a skill for that can have a big impact on on character decisions, on how you build your character. You know, if you're making your artificers suddenly, you know, you're not just making generic intelligence checks for for doing like certain mechanical features or working with certain technology, there's an actual skill for that now, so it, it can have an impact. Yeah. Now, when it com when it comes to when it comes to those skills, there's some um, obvious obviously 
the class system within D and D, as well as the whole background system, has the notion of of skills that you have proficiency in. Um, given that in mind, is is there a bit of back adaptation so that um, classes that would be in the player's handbook will be listed as as being able to take those skills as profic as um proficiencies, or is it a case where any with the new skills, any class can potentially take them as a proficiency instead of one of their normal ones. No, we do want to, you're right, we do want to try and uh, limit it a little bit in that way. It will be a bit of backtracking, and we're going to say, okay, here are some skills we have available to players. Um, they are available right off the bat. Of course, you can learn them with any class, but they're available right off the bat for class A, B, and C um, for this set of skills, and or for this skill. And then this skill... Uh, is more the 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 talents and uh, abilities of X class are perhaps a bit more uh, close to it. So classes C, D, and E can use this skill, um, at least um, right off the bat, as I keep saying. Yeah. And when it com when it comes to when it, now, when it comes to feats, which is some, which is something that I end up that I personally end up house ruling because the idea of having somebody only only customize every four levels I don't care for. Mm -hmm. um, what what are some what are some of the examples of feats that you're put that you're putting in and how and how would they um, expand the sand? I know I use the term sandbox a lot, but that's the most reliable term when it comes to just expressing the whole of what players can do. Yeah, no, I hear you. The um, so some of the feats have to do with the skills. So it's feats for using certain skills and extra bonuses when using those skills. Um, but another notable one was uh, that we have planned is for how players interact with the world below. So if you've checked out, um, if anyone's checked out our our module um, or our beta encounter that we have available, our beta and free encounter map that we have on our Kickstarter right now, we've actually listed. Um, and this is planned for a different chapter of the book, but we decided to give it to players a bit early. We've listed the consequences for entering the Red Mist. Um, so if a player is to, to enter the world below and, and inhale the Red uh, Mist, there is a series of stages of sort of madness, or I shouldn't say madness because that's an actual mechanic in a different module, I'm pretty sure. But um, there's certain stages of, of sanity and, and madness that they, they go through. Um, as the red mist kind of takes hold, and one of the feats we have planned is for how players will deal with that. Um, you know, what kind of bonuses do they get when they're down in the world below? How do they resist the red mist? Can they resist the red mist? This feat is going to help you out with that a little bit, or maybe even give you an advantage while you're down there. All right, that makes sense. And um, um, when it comes to the red mist, do you ha do you have it planned that there that um there's certain pr there's certain protective equipment that can be taken to um, of, to avoid breathing in the mist, at least temporarily? Um, in terms of, like, if you're asking if there's gas masks <laughs> or something like that, um, no, we don't have any gas masks or kind of uh, like typical breathing apparatus like that planned. Um, I suppose if a player, like, put a cloth up to their mouth or something, the DM might give them advantage on, on their rolls for something uh, to do with the red mist. Or perhaps uh, maybe just a flat like one or two number value addition to their rolls, um, but there is I think there is one ob there's only one object in the game. There's one sort of legendary item we have in the in the campaign that allows players to very easily negate the effects of the red mist. Mm -hmm. um, and it's you know I should say spoiler alert, but it's a very players will find it's a very important item that they'll most likely want to try and get before uh, getting too deep into the campaign so that they can you know, proceed without too much fear of the world below. Because the, the consequences of, of falling victim to the Red Mist are very intense. Mm -hmm. They are, as they're listed in the, um, in the sample encounter, you just attack whatever the closest thing is to you, the, the closest living thing that is not an eldritch creature, you are compelled to attack it with whatever means you have and that might mean you know you have like a fifth level fireball up your sleeve suddenly you're casting that fifth level of fireball um i mean it, it's up to the player's discretion of course how they want to try and go about it 
but uh, but when when the ruling says you feel compelled to attack anything close by, that can be a very serious threat to the other players. Um, yeah. yeah. When it now, given the given the and the part of the reason I ask and the, and. Admittedly, this admittedly, if I was if I was running Alhami, I might end, I might end up having to house rule this myself. Um, but I was reminded I was reminded of the Shadowlands in Legend of the Five Rings, which is one of my which is one of my favorite games and settings. And the um, the samurai clan that's closest to that area, the Crab Clan, will you will um, utilize Jade in order to resist the Shadowlands corrupting effects. But it's only te- it's only temporary. They'll usually bring like a um, finger, a piece of jade that's the size of a man's finger, and it'll protect them for about a week before it crumbles. Um, so that's the that's the kind of thing that I was cu- I was curious about because, um, what do you do you see go do you see going into going into the mist as as a um, as a potential death se- as a potential um, death sentence for people who want to avoid mutation, it, it is. It is certainly. Uh, we are definitely going to illustrate very clearly to players that going into the red mist uh, has extremely dire consequences. Um, we want to give players the freedom to explore this world as much as they want, but having this sort of um, this. You know, idea or placing this idea in their heads that going down there is certain doom. It's it's kind of uh, motivating in a way. It's very. I know when I was um, there's this one uh, encounter I was running when I was DMing for for that group I mentioned earlier. And there's this uh, there's this there was this prison they were in, and uh, the prison was built into a sort of ravine um, or crevice, a crack in the earth. Um, and there was a there was a single elevator that went up and down um, through the the different cells that were built into the walls of this uh, ravine. And I remember telling my players, "Listen, guys, if you jump and you fall down that ravine, you're going to take X amount of damage. And being level one, you will probably die." <laughs> and the effect it had on them was they were so much more invested in every action they took while they were traversing the ravine or trying to jump onto the elevator or if they were trying to fight the guards that were in the elevator they were so careful and they were so um invested in what was going on because they were scared (laughs) and that's kind of the effect that we want to uh, create with the world below is it is yes it's an area you will eventually have access to it but hey if you want to go down there right now you'll probably die um and that that's just part of the story sometimes yeah. When, um, now, when it comes to aerial encounters, um, I th- I realize that this is this is one of those things that's gen- that's probably going to be trickier to implement because there's no real support for this kind for this kind of thing. Um, when it how are, how are you going to? Ha- First off, how are you going? How are you going to have this sort this sort of thing work? And second, do you intend to have a chapter just dedicated to exploring ship on ship combat? Uh, yes. So uh, our very one of our like very first chapters that we have describes um, ship on ship combat and uh, aerial encounters very in depthly. We want to make sure we nail mechanics down for that, right? Because we know that um, I think it's in Ghosts of Salt Marsh. There's a few rules about like naval combat, um, and I took a look at them. I have I have Ghosts of Salt Marsh. I wasn't the bi- I wasn't the biggest fan of the the system they had in place there. I thought the players needed a bit more individuality. They needed a bit more freedom to do um, what they want and make sure that not everyone just becomes like a, a you know rolling dice for 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 one character who's calling the shots or anything like that. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yes, a, a large portion of one of our earlier chapters is dedicated to, hey, here are a series of optional rules. They're all optional. We want to give you some, you know, we want to give leeway. 
Uh, and you know, you, if you if you choose not to follow one of these rules, it's not going to break the campaign. Uh, but here's a series of optional rules that could very well um, optimize and um, make it easier to engage in ship to ship combat. Here is how different weapons might work. Um, here is how actually moving the ship works. Who moves the ship? Mm -hmm. um, on whose turn does the ship move? Does it move simultaneously? Um, what about enemy ships? Like how how do their crews work and stuff like that? Um, so yes, we do have a good chunk of, of one of our earlier chapters dedicated to that. Um, I definitely want to make it on a more individual basis. I want to make it. I want to make sure that we give each and every player on a ship the chance to contribute um, and influence what's going on. It's not going to be, um, hey, here's the captain. The captain is flying the ship, and the captain needs to command you to do this, um, and then that you know you roll the dice for whatever the captain wants. It is going to be um, there's going to be conflict sometimes. Sometimes you know you might have one person who's flying the ship, and they fly it way off to you know starboard or whatever. And you've, you're on the cannons, and you want to shoot this cannon, but now you're out of range, perhaps. Mm -hmm. um, or perhaps you want to drop down onto the enemy ship, and the person flying your, your airship doesn't. And now you two are going to wrestle for the controls and try and get, get yourselves over there. Like, how does that work? You know, what if there's a conflict over the controls? How does that work? So, yeah, we want to try and extensively outline some rules so that if players want, you know, the, the answers are there. Um, but we know a lot of people have their own kind of house rules for this sort of thing as well. So they're, they're all optional and it's not like it's written exclusively throughout the campaign in a way that if one rule wasn't there, the whole encounter might fall apart. All right. That makes, that makes sense. Um, and get, and given that, given that, especially when we hinted at the whole thing with, um, harpies having a default, having a default, um, fly speed, um, how are you? Go how are you going to handle three-dimensional combat, i.e., dog fighting? Well, we're we're looking at using sort of when you move on a two D plane, it's it's somewhat easy to uh, you know say okay, X amount is five feet uh, on the plane. So we're, we're we're looking at systems that are like we don't want the DM alone to be tracking where everyone else is vertically. We don't want um, players to constantly be asking the DM, hey, how high up is this ship? Am I in range? Um, we want a, a visual way on the board to try and indicate height mm -hmm. and verticality. So we're thinking of implementing sort of a, a D20. I'm using like a D20 beside entities in order to represent where they are in space, um, where every for every one on the, on the D20, you are um, 100 feet away from a reference point. And that reference point, it will usually be the player's ship. Um, but then how does this work if multiple things are moving? What if the player's ship is moving? Um, there's a lot of layers to this. So it's something we want to try and um, flesh out even more as we move forward. But we have a, a sort of base system down by using like a D20 to represent uh, levels of height. And yes, that might mean... Um, you can only move in, in, in somewhat larger increments. No, you can't move, like, it, it'll be hard to represent moving five feet up. You might need to move 50 feet up. Um, but we think that it's a good, um, it's a good middle ground between uh, having the freedom to go where you want and the DM not losing their mind trying to keep, uh, you know, write down how high up the seventh ship in the encounter is as they enter the field. It's that that's um that that definitely makes sense. Um and of now taking that taking that taking that into taking that into account, um I'm guess I'm guessing that there's get that there's gonna be some um rule modifications so that so that class so that um classes can be integrated with this with this new rule set. Like so, you're so if somebody is pl if somebody is playing well, not not to pick on you for this, but a basic fighter, mm -hmm. um, they're not going. They're they're um, like if they're if they're bringing in a basic fighter from straight up D and D, then um, they'd be able to, they'd be able to integrate themselves with the um tech with the technology as far as 
as far as how to, as far as operating the ship so that they're not just left out left out in the cold yeah well like i said i want everybody to have a, a you know feel like they can contribute um you know being able to fly an, an airship is no easy task if um if my fighter who has no experience with it tries to operate the ship they can they can try they can try their very best will it always work out no <laughs> but they can try there's no there's no sense in saying no you you just cannot operate the ship um there might be detriments to it you know there might be you might have disadvantage on certain roles um but there's going to be other elements of the ship and other elements of aerial combat that you don't need you know all these specializations or anything to take part in like if the fighter wants to you know jump off of their ship and land on the enemies and start taking out the people on the weapons so that the cannons aren't firing at your airship you know power to them um, if they want to operate a ballista it's not going to require like three different proficiencies to do that um you know if the engine room is on fire then they do not need uh, proficiency in mechanics to try and put out the fire you know they will be able to contribute in that way um but if you're asking me if like just anybody can walk up to the airship controls and immediately just like do it flawlessly uh no i, I don't think that's that would be fair to players who want to kind of orient their their background around that kind of thing as well. Mm -hmm. And now when it comes now with that with that kind of thing in, with that kind of thing in mind um for like we've seen we've seen the we've seen the regular regular size um ships and I'm, what I'm curious about is how how big and small are sh our ships going to get? Are we are we going to be seeing galleon-sized airships in this setting? That's a great question. Um, so, it, looking at our antagonists for st uh, for scale, when I um, commissioned the artist for the antagonist, I said to them, "Make this the biggest boat that you can like possibly imagine. Make it like cruiser, like you know." Uh, like cruise ship style big i want this thing to be massive um because they are going to be like a unique exception to the world most ships you find will be yes they will be sort of um a lot of of traders and stuff like that might use like sort of sailboat style uh size ships yes galleons will be around but there's also a royal navy in this world there is the alhami royal navy um there is a, a monarchy there is this government in place um ruling this kingdom that is still exists even up in the sky and they have a somewhat sizable navy with somewhat sizable ships um they have their their capital ship the queen's ship um is is maybe like uh it's it, it, it's it's somewhat of a cruiser. It's pretty big. It, it's it's very it, it's quite large. So you're gonna find there's a lot of variance in that. Um, but well, with that comes cost as well. A, you know, players if they want to get a bigger ship, if they want to operate a bigger ship, there's gonna be not just an initial price tag, but how do you have the crew to operate this ship? And when I say that, I don't mean like like uh, you know, do you have enough players? I mean, do you want to hire X amount of crew so that sales can be unfurled? or the engine can be started, or coal can be shoveled into it, or stuff like that. Um, so certain ships will have certain requirements, um, but there's there's a bit of variance there. Yeah. And what, now, with that, with that kind of thing in mind, um, I want to, I want to ask about scale, because whenever I, th whenever I think about doing ship on ship combat, I, the, Obviously, I end up thinking of um, the small scale. Your good old swash and bu swash and buckle, because um, I could because one of the e one of the most um, easy sort of things I could see I could see integrating is just dealing with pirates, because mm -hmm. you've got you've got all this wide open space up in the sky, and that and that's plenty of ambush areas for all for all sorts of people with the black flag. Um, so, but um, but there's also the whole idea of having lo not full not full on fleets, but something a little in the middle between between those two scales. 
Is that something that you have that you plan to address within the book? Where you've got um, multiple ship sizes in engagements. I I want to say yes, we will have it's not going to be, you know, your ship versus the single pirate ship. Mm -hmm. Um if the player is higher a a mercenary band to protect them on an especially dangerous mission or um to try and defeat uh an especially dangerous enemy or perhaps attack like a pirate base where they know there's multiple ships there um you know yes that's going to be an option i'm not going to overextend here and say yes this module allows you to have full scat like full scale uh you know wars with like 100 ships on your side and 100 ships on the other side or anything like that. We, we are not writing uh, the rules for like uh, huge engagements like that. And if a DM wants to try and run it using our rules, they, they, they can. I don't see why they can't. They just might find some logistical issues once you get into like 12 or 13 ships on the field. Um, uh, but that's something we also kind of, you know, we, we thought about it a little bit as well. We thought about hey, um, if we were going to do an expansion for this campaign, what might we want to do it on? And the two things that came up were um, an economics an economics kind of uh, uh, approach to it in that we outline all these different trade routes and materials and towns and what they produce and um, give the players the tools to really make like a trading kind of empire. Um, and that becomes a game of numbers, but some people really enjoy that. Um, and then the other one we looked at was the war game, as we called it. We called it the war game expansion um, because we were looking at, okay, what if um, what if we hit X stretch goal and we have the neighboring kingdom beside Alham um, attack and uh, suddenly a war breaks out and you and your party have been summoned or you are you're able to take part in it um, in some way, shape, or form. How would that work? And we talked about it for a while and we, we think that that could be something we address. But we would probably need more resources to do it. Um, we want to try and, you know, like you said before, keep it somewhat focused here and mm -hmm. um, make sure that whatever bases we are hitting, we hit them right. Um, yeah. All right, I I can definitely get that. Now, as far as now putting aside um, stretch goals, because obviously I don't I don't want to. Um, I don't want to. I don't want anybody to count chickens before they hatch. No, nope, of course not. Um, what are you shooting for as far as the page count? Are you thinking around two hundred and fifty? Thinking about two hundred. We're thinking about somewhere between one hundred and seventy to two hundred. All right. And yeah. Obviously, if obviously if you guys if you guys end up reaching stretch goals, that's pro that's going to expand. Um, that's correct. I will. I will admit the one. The one stretch goal that I'm looking that I'm hope that I'm hoping gets at, gets added is the arsenalist. Um, it is been added. It, we hit it. We are. Uh, oh, I think we're all right. at all right. Six thousand uh, one hundred dollars, and my, the stretch goal is at six thousand. My bad. In in my defense, it's automatic. When I look at the when I look at the numbers at the top, it's automatically converting to U.S. dollars, and and um. I for, I forgot that 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 the entry down there was six thousand Canadian. Uh yes. Yeah, see, we, you know, that, that's an issue we were looking at when we have a whole section of the Kickstarter and it, we call it the ancillary section. And we we explicitly say there, hey guys, Canadian money is not worth as much. So like, don't look at these numbers and freak out because, because uh, <laughs> uh, you know the, the conversion rate is very yeah could be a little steep. <laughs> um. You think you think I'd be used to that with all the different convert with all the different um, currency conversions that I've had I've had to do in the last six years, um, but I but part of the reason that part of the reason I looked at the I looked at that one as an appeal is one, um, the artificer doesn't get enough love, mm -hmm. um, like it's I'm glad I'm glad to see that Wizards of the Coast actually made a new base class for once, but. There's not a whole lot of options when it comes to subclasses for it compared to others, and two, the idea the idea of having the fantasy version of the engineer from Team Fortress Two appeals to me because that's what I saw out of this thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, you know what? I would almost want to say it is the heavy from TF Two is almost what I want to compare it to more more so than the engineer. Mm -hmm. um, it's it's about using big guns or big weapons. 
yeah. uh, modifying those big weapons uh, and, and making Natasha, as he calls it, um, and loving Natasha. <laughs> well, I, I, I think the reason why I ended up going to, going towards engineer is because is because like the heavy is just, the heavy is just is just is just Sasha and a shotgun that nobody uses. Um, mm-hmm. No, no disrespect to anybody who uses a shotgun, but let's be honest: the scatter gun. If any, if I want to use a class with a scatter gun, I'll probably end up picking scout. Yep. Um. But I, I brought. But it's the variety of big weaponry that's the re- that's the reason why I uh, made the um, engineer comparison because they have because of course they have the t- they can make turrets, they can make dispensers, they can make teleporters. Um. All. And cu- and customize it how they how they see fit. Um, also, also, uh, also, the Meet the Engineer is one of my favorite skits. So there's so there's that. It's the one where he's playing the guitar, right? And uh, yeah, in the, uh, by the campfire. Yeah, I like that one. <laughs> yeah, it's just that the campfire happens to be one of the people he killed. <laughs> um. That was a long time that came out. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> um. But the th- the um. But the thing, but the thing, the thing is, especially especially with um artificers, is that's a that's a class that is that has a lot that has a lot of untapped potential. Mm-hmm. And I see the arsenalist as tr- is trying to tap into some of that potential by. Sh- by showing here's all here's all this here's a bunch of a bunch of big guns you can make or and later on make even bigger guns. Um, yeah. Also, I'm waiting to see how long it's going to take before somebody tries to argue about making the fantasy version of the BFG. <laughs> yeah. Oh man. Yeah. How many uh, how many D6s do you need for that one? Huh. <laughs> um. Enough that you're no longer playing D and D. You're playing Shadowrun. <laughs> or if I wanted to be a smart ass, I could say that you need sixty six d sixes. Six d six d sixes. But like I said, smart ass. But now I do want to congratulate you guys on get on um getting past your uh, goal with days to spare. Now the end date that you guys have is November sixth. Um. Now, after, now, obviously, take, taking into account the whole two-week delay between between um, wrapping up the Kickstarter and actually getting the money, um, what are you shooting for as far as a release window? Are you thinking first quarter 2021? 20, we have it set right now as uh, May, May 2021 for the, the digital um, the digital pieces is when those will arrive, and then... Uh, we want to give ourselves like 30 days to save for shipping for the hard copies. So uh, early June 2021 is is when we're aiming for for the um, for the hard copies. Mm-hmm. We want to give ourselves plenty of time. I know when we ran our first campaign, I think someone asked a question about this. They're like, "Wow, that's a long time away." We're like, "We're like, hey, we we want to make sure whatever this thing is that we're putting out, it's you know done as well as we possibly can do it. We don't want um, to disappoint anyone with like release days or when shipping stuff arrives, so we want to try and give ourselves as much time as possible. Um, yeah, and it's definitely something that I'll be I'll be looking forward to, I'll be looking forward to, um, especially since I think fantasy gaming needs needs more needs more rangers wielding automatic repeating crossbows. <laughs> That's that's what we were saying as well. That that was the idea. And this, plus, I want plus I want to see how long it's going to take before some before somebody tries to make the crossbow version of a shotgun, or just a regular you know, shotgun. I'm not sure if you guys are using black powder. You know, after saying that, you might just find that we're going to stick it in the book. <laughs> Which, if 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 that's if that's the case, I will t- if that's the case, I will end up taking all of the cr- all the credit. Thank you. <laughs> but look, if you're gonna if you're gonna be making a subclass that's all that's all about gu- that's all about guns, then you then you have to treat it like you're going as crazy as a '90s FPS with guns. 
as far mm-hmm. as I'm concerned. And that's, that's fair enough. I know some might I know some might say, but but that this is that this is a fantasy game and not a sci-fi game like a lot of FPSs were. But um, I I ha- I have two I have two words to counteract that: heretic and hexen. <laughs> both of them are fantasy games, and bo- both of them were fantasy FPSs, and both of them had crazy weaponry. Uh, one one place I keep finding myself looking to for inspiration for our weapons, or at least for the um, arsonist, is Ratchet and Clank. Uh, that That's... series, with all their weapons, just makes me... like. I remember the cover art for uh, Ratchet and Clank. I think it was Going Commando, and he's mm-hmm. Ratchet's sitting there with this huge gun that's like the size of him, and I thought, oh man, this is like... That's so creative. It's so great. I want to do something like that. <laughs> Plus, I've always enjoyed putting in things like the noisy cricket in, in um, games. You know, something that's really powerful, but also knocks you on your ass. Mm. Oh, but like like I said, I'll definitely be keep keeping an eye on the in, on the um, insanity. Um, with with that with all with all that in mind, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come up to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. Thank you so much. It's been so great being here. You've asked, you know, these are such good questions, and you have such a great show here. So I'm, I'm honored. Yeah. And anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. And as I often say here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. <laughs> and of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to enjoy the show. And there will be plenty more craziness ha- happening, as there always is here on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody!